we should look at the identified trauma that people experience. And we need to identify when it's appropriate to address the current day issues, such as HIV, such as being in a, a, a stigmatized group, all of those things, those are all important. But we need to look at what happens through the traumatized experience of people. And, and that's where we're really heading with this HIV perspective. So I'm going to share... I'm going to share my screen and we'll go back to what we've been talking about um, throughout this group. Through, okay. And so when we looked at the original um, model of traumatization, we recognize that there are individual variables. There's variables about the person that brings about, about the trauma that we experience. The additional variables that are so important to talk about are things such as intimate, in, intimate partner violence, Because when someone contracts HIV or any of the traumatic um, issues that we've talked about, it comes important that there is the potential for intimate partner violence. And it can come in the guise of things such as disclosure, right? Uh, isolation, fear, depression, PTSD. And I have mentioned that within any traumatic event that the majority of intimate partners leave within the first 12 months of a traumatic event occurring. That's in an isolated acute situation. But if we look at it from a chronic issue where there's been abuse and trauma and chaos through childhood and into adulthood, intimate partner violence becomes just that more of a subject that we need to discuss because it's more probabilistic that we end up in those relationships than if we didn't experience that trauma before. And it has to do with the symptomology of being traumatized. And we need to recognize those issues within our intimate partner. And so in the guys that we're discussing in this group class, it's important to have a group for survivors, but it's also important to have a group of those individuals who are family members, who are living the situation. And we recognize that with a lot of the AA groups, they have AA groups for the addict and they have AA groups and al groups and all of the different AA acronyms for the family members, especially for the intimate partners. Because those situations need to evolve. And we've already talked about the importance of knowing the social situation, okay? When we go to the community level, and I'll circle it right here. So in the past 20 years, homophobia and issues of uh, HIV and the issues of, of indiscriminate sexual activity, those on the social level have been on the decrease where people don't question that. But 
at the level of service that we are all at. Um, even though there's been laws that say that same gendered people can get married and, and some of those lax laws about sexuality and all those have been corrected in a lot of states. And I hope someday federally, we have to recognize that the population that we are working with here and now, maybe not in 10, 15 years, have been raised in a society that is one homophobic, transphobic, prejudice, and discriminatory because they don't meet those social norms that we expect of individuals. So the community-based level, even though there has become so much more acceptance over the last 20 years, the population we are working with still deal with these community-based violence. And I am gonna call it violence, because it is. Um, and we can go beyond HIV in this issue. We can go into women's rights. We can go into domestic violence. We can go into sexual assault. We can go into minority issues. Uh, and, and we see that community really does determine a lot about the mental health of that community. And when there are populations of minority groups, of disenfranchised groups, we can see this conflict. And we are seeing this in Arizona. We all have to admit to this, that we're going through a transition phase here where we're going from the strict binary, the strict rules of conduct to this more of, hey, we're diverse. There's not a fit all solution for everyone. And on the community based level, that is the thing that us as facilitators of a group, regardless of the group, should pay attention to. Because there's not a one fits all solution. And then we go to institutional violence, which is something else we, oh, that's a weird circle. Institutional <laughs> violence, which is the substance use, HIV criminalization laws, educational, vocational, housing, and healthcare discrimination. There are, there are states, including Arizona, that still have laws against renting or leasing a home to homosexuals or people who don't meet the binary man woman situation. So there's institutional things that when we're dealing with disenfranchised populations that we need to make sure as facilitators we're addressing and understanding because this is not a personal issue. This is an issue of society. It's not something that a person sitting in a group session can fix. And I bring this up because we have to do this collectively. And we have to do this in a conjointed effort, not just within our individual group setting, because this will continue once our clients leave our group, no matter what disenfran disenfranchised group they come from. And then let's look at living with a traumatic event. In this case, we're talking about HIV, but we can also talk about domestic violence. We can talk about cancer. We can talk about heart disease. We can talk about anything that disenfranchises the individual from the popular culture. 
Because obviously, if you have diabetes, if you have heart disease, if you have this, it's because you're obese or not living the right life, the right lifestyle. But I'm hoping through the courses that we have given at TOCC and what you will continue to do when you go to university, that there is no individual part to anything. That when we deal with life situations, it's not just about the individual. It's about the institution. It's about the community. And it's about the relationships that we build. And so when we come to group work, that's what we're trying to establish is a community that understands that the individual, yes, has responsibility, but the community, the family, society, culture also has responsibility. Okay. And so when we look at HIV in, in transmission, we see that it's disproportionate to communities. And I hope that you all recognize that the thing that's not included in this graph is our Native American communities and how they've been affected. And that is going to be one of the most difficult tasks of being a group facilitator, a behavioral health uh, uh, counselor, anything that you do when we're dealing with Native American communities is that we don't have good data on what's going on in the situation. And so we do need to take it from a subjective level, a subjective level that states that this particular issue that we're dealing with impacts Native American communities. And I'll bring up an example beyond HIV. All right, white male Americans commit suicide. Let, let's, let, let's go down that road for a minute. Commit suicide at a disproportionate level in suicide attempts. But when we take it to the community level, the highest risk population is Native American populations for suicide risk, not white male Americans. When we took it, take it at a proportionate level. And that's one of the things that we need to do as being part of the Native American community is looking at proportionate rates. And when you're doing group facilitation, these statistics don't really matter. And I hope everyone understands that. And so we can talk about men, right? up to 25 to 65% of HI positive men who have sex with men experience child sexual abuse. We can talk about these issues regardless of sexual orientation. We know that statistically either a fourth or a third of men who have experienced childhood trauma will, will become HIV positive. That's a correlation, it's not causation, but it is an important statistic as we move forward. Trauma experiences are not limited to 
just men and the homeless and the incarcerated or the physically abused or those who have experienced violence. There is a group that if you were to do a trauma group on HIV or any of the different types of disorders that people can contribute, you have to recognize that those are there are individuals where this is the first generation that has experienced those issues. And with HIV, it is the same thing. It doesn't take a same sex relationship. It doesn't take homelessness, physical abuse or incarceration to get HIV, but these populations are at risk. And that's something important to, to continue with. Gay and same sex gender loving men living with HIV are significantly affected by intimate partner violence. Intimate partner violence is, is something close to me and, and I think I've expressed this in this class. But there is no difference between same sex violence and heterosex violence. The rates are the same. And so if you think in a situation that if you're a man and you're in a violent situation and you think when you get out of that relationship, I'm just gonna go be with another man. If you think that decreases your chances of experiences intimate violence, you're wrong. It's wrong to think that the lesbian, the homosexual male population and everything experiences intimate partner violence at a different rate. We all, we all experience that at the same percentage. And so just thinking that if I get out of this opposite sex relationship into a same sex relationship, will fix any violence or anything that is occurring in your relationship. I hate to tell you this, statistically, that's a very bad decision. Yes, you should get out of that violent relationship. I don't disagree with that. But assuming that if you get in a different intimate relationship, it will fix everything, that's the issue, okay? H gay and same-sex gender loving men living with HIV are significantly affected by This goes back to the same situation, okay? Yes, when you have a disease and you're in an intimate relationship, does it put you at risk for violence or being left alone? The honest response is yes, yes. And I've expressed this in, in, in our previous lectures where I've stated that uh, men or women, when their spouse has been violated sexually, you know, or I would even say physically, um, but I'm not going to go there because the evidence isn't there yet, but they leave within the first 12 months. And this is the truth with anything, with any disorder. When we talk about HIV, diabetes, uh, heart disease, um, any of those type of disorders, we see, we see the leaving mark where the person who was there significantly then sees this person in different sight, a different way, and within 12 months, they leave. Statistically, that's probable. And in the group setting, we need to make sure we take that into account, especially when we're dealing with people who, who society has deemed as high risk, such as people with HIV, people who are homosexual, people who are lesbian, people who are Native American, we can put all of that into a category and say, no, statistically, it doesn't fit, okay? HIV positive MSM face chronic stress for stigma relating to HIV status, as well as their sexual orientation. 
So when we talk about people who have HIV positive, they, they are in a same sex relationship, but they're also in a opposite sexual relationship. Uh, some of the proper term, not proper, I'm not, I'm not gonna say, more of the cultural terms are MFM, male, female, male. And they do feel a stigmatization, not only by society, because society in our culture in the United States has said relationships could, should occur between a man and a female. And it's only been in the recent 10, year, 10 years that we've accepted that it should be male, male, female, female. But there's still this stigmatized group that there's a man, there's a female, there's a man, there's a female, there's a man, there's a female. And those groups face a lot of criticism and fear about things like HIV, things like intimate partner violence, things like those that, that, that people who are in the binary relationship do not understand. And so when we talk about trauma, we have to come to an understanding that trauma affects unfringized populations a lot more than what we that 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 what the normal Western culture is is attuned to. In fact, we can actually put a statistic to it. I mentioned this class in this class before. PTSD is a 17% chance. Whenever one of us experiences trauma, that we will have continued symptoms from that trauma. And I've given that statistic, that 17%. But when we're a member of an enfranchised group, meaning we're not part of that popular culture, we're not part of what determines those issues, our percentage increases. In fact, our percentage increases to 32%. Because we're a member of that group that receives so much stigmatization because of who we are. And as a group facilitator, that is an issue that you will need to address and make sure that those individuals don't feel like they're a member of a stigmatized group. And then I noticed at the bottom here, at the bottom of our slide, trans-Pacific risk will be noted in the next few slides. So let's take a look at this. Okay, let, let, let's look at specifically women, HIV and lifetime trauma. When we look at the rates of sexual abuse and childhood physical abuse, 39 to 42% respectively, somewhere between there, depending upon the study. Among living women with HIV, are more than twice the nation's rate. So we have the stigmatized group, especially with women. And we have to recognize as group facilitators that their trauma is not, I'm not gonna say normal. I'm gonna say it's more significant than the non-traumatized um, group. A, a, a male child who is sexually abused, who has life trauma, will be much more resilient and successful because of the culture that that child lives in than will be women or trans individuals. And we need to recognize that. We need to know that, that when people come to our group, into our groups and into our situation, that when we're dealing with disenfranchised populations, 
that the trauma is going to be intensified. It's not going to fit the literature, as we would say. Okay. Women who experience childhood sexual abuse have a reported sevenfold, seven times increased risk of HIV risk behaviors. I, okay. HIV has totally been associated with men, especially gay men. But what has not been recognized is that a gay male has less of a chance of a track of having HIV than a female, whether she is lesbian or whether she is quote unquote straight. The thing that our society has not recognized is that women experience this trauma seven times more than a male counterpart. And so when we focus our group on men and masculinity and on the male experience, we're going down the wrong route. It's not about masculinity. It's not about being a man. It's not about those things. Trauma is not about that. Okay, I'll get, let's go on with the next. Trans women experience high rates of physical 57% and sexual assault 47%. And when we look at, th this is cross-cultural and, and I'm gonna spend some time on this notation because I know that the Native American community has uh, adopted the term about two-spirited individuals. And that is an individual who is transsexual, who fulfills the need of both masculine needs and feminine needs. And they were honored in the tradition before Westernization. And we need to recognize that among many of our native communities. But what has been Westernized about especially trans women is that there's something wrong. There's something wrong about them because they not recognizing that their physical body is what they are according to traditional Western standards. And so the trauma they experience especially with trans women is significantly harder to deal with and to honor. And it's our job as facilitators to not make those individuals feel like they're abnormal. They're, they're perfectly fine. They, they're on the continuum a pure male per versus fe pure female. And if any of you have listened to any of my lectures in the past, I have I expressed this. There is nothing, there is no one on this earth that is 100% female or 100% male. We all are on a continuum between those two. Western culture teaches us that there's females and that there's males. As providers, we need to recognize that there's a continuum of both biology and sexuality, okay? American women living with HIV suffer intimate violence at a rate of 55.3%. I. I told, I've recognized this before that that, that that is a small adjustment to what we see with intimate partner violence, but it's only a 5% adjustment. If we take the 55.3% at face value, that yes, um, HIV sufferers do experience partner 
violence, intimate partner violence at a rate that is above 50%. And we need to recognize that. And it's, I don't want anyone to think that I'm diminishing that ideal. But we ha also have to recognize the reason that percentage is higher is because those individuals are breaking the social norm of binary relationships. And, 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 and so their percentage is a bit higher, it's not much higher. So I'm gonna stop right now and I'm gonna ask if there's any questions from, from the class. Um, Cause I've been, I've been on a soapbox for much too long. So it's you guys' turn. Uh, questions regarding the topic that we're on or topics that we're trying to address. Is there any questions? I have something to say. Um, instead of it, um, you, like switching our language, instead of using like transphobia, because that's like, that's also victimizing the people that are transphobic. Um, it's the trans community has spoken out to say it's like trans for trans people. I am so appreciative that you brought that up. Uh, and, and I've been using the nom nomenclature in, in terminology. But yes, I, I, I agree with you that the terminology in itself needs to change. And that it's not trans people, it's not trans this, it's they're human beings, right? And, and so I agree with you in the language that we use needs to change. Is that it? Is that what you're speaking to? Yes, yes. that's also even um, that's even taking it far as like our indigenous, like indigenous food sovereignty. One of the biggest things, um, you know, I'm a I'm a indigenous certified indigenous breastfeeding um, lactation specialist. And one of the things that, you know, we're really pushing for with indigenous food sovereignty is making sure that we're calling it chest feeding instead of like breastfeeding because um, because not everybody identifies as a female. Um, they're a parent, they can be non-binary. Uh, it just, you know, how they, who they are. And so I, changing the language is um, extremely important. I totally agree. And what a beautiful statement you just made. I, I really, honestly. That, that's such a beautiful statement that you made about changing the nomenclature from breastfeeding to chest feeding and, and making sure that there's an inclusive environment. And that's such a beautiful statement that you just made because that's what we're supposed to be achieving in the group setting is that there's this inclusion, right? And that we make sure that when, when we are in the group setting, we use language that is inclusive. And what a beautiful example. Thank you for that. Any other questions or comments? Because that was an amazing comment. So is there any other questions or comments as we move forward? a question. Um, I'm quite curious to what Native tribes in Arizona have adopted, you know, the transgender, I guess. Um, where can I get that information? Because I know the tribe that I come from, I haven't heard of any adoption of any kind, but I'm just curious. And then also, um, I've always been curious to as far as Native American goes, the data with HIV, um, you know, here locally, um, whenever we do studies, it's like the data that we use, it feels like it's so outdated. There's not, nothing ever current, you know, and something I've always questioned. Um, IHS, our local Indian Health Services, you know, like when do they ever update it? Okay, again, I'm going to say you, you, you all have 
such beautiful comments on on this situation, especially when it comes to HIV trauma and all of those types of things and and non binary is the Western term that has been utilized right. And so when we look at Native American communities with HIV. You are totally correct that the data is completely out of date, and I do want to put some explanation behind this. The 1980s, 1990s, there was a lot of research done on HIV, and there was a lot, much of the material I'm presenting today comes from the 1980s to the 1990s. But beginning in the 2000s, the federal government started to defund HIV research. And so there's not really any really good um, uh, percentages of, of population rates when it comes to HIV. We do have the statistics I presented here were because there has been continued funding about, about intimate, violent, intimate partner violence and those kinds of things. So that's what we can present here. Um, and so when it comes to population rates and cultural rates, we don't really have a good grasp on HIV rates. And, and your question is very valid and needs continued research. And, and you know, that's, that's one of my hopes about all of you is that you don't stop at your associate's level. You, you continue to get your degree. You continue to become those people that can make influences to make sure that when it comes to Native American issues, that those are addressed. Because what we know is we don't know much beyond the 1980s and the 1990s. Um, there, there was a first question that I didn't address. What was it? You, you, you asked a couple questions, but I only addressed the Native American population rate. But there was a first question that has lost my mind. What was that one? Was it um, the one about which tribe have adopted? I mean, like, I'm just curious to, mm. you know, which native tribes in Arizona have adopted that. So we do know, so the Tana Otham, and I do know that the um, uh, Northern Arizona Navajo have adopted the whole idea of the two-spirited ideal that that people have the potential to have both male female qualities within them and that they may have a determinant towards one or the other um, so the navajo and the tanatham i know have adopted those ideals in expression of hiv and understanding hiv um, but i'm I, I need to be honest with Arizona tribes beyond the Tana Otham and beyond the Navajo, I'm not sure what the other tribes within Arizona have adopted as far as understanding that issue. Lauren posted, and I, 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 and I think this is an important point, Lauren posted, I have followed the statistics of HIV in my area. There isn't a total that I have found. The one that I see are the tribal health departments, ones doing education teaching. There aren't any support groups or high static that I hear. Uh, there was a high STD of syphilis I heard uh, of some years ago. Lauren, I think I I think that's a very important point. Is that um, among Native American communities, there hasn't been a high emphasis on this disenfranchised group. That it comes to fruition, as Lauren has stated, that it only comes fruition when 
those individuals have actually been diagnosed with that disorders. There's no groups or anything that actually support the prevention end or the intervention end. It's only in those life stages where the disorder has taken over the person's life that among these groups that, that there's a lot of inter intervention. And so Lauren, thank you for, for that insight. Um, it, it's very well taken. Thank you for that. Um, here locally on White Mountain, um, I work with John Hopkins University. And so right now, one of the current studies that I'm working on is um, HIV prevention. Um, and so I find that this like lecture really, really interesting and it kind of it's an eye opener to a lot of things. And, you know, I'm always picking on our PHNs to like, where's the data, you know? And so in this study, we have a surveillance system that we get referrals from, from the hospital. So any person that, you know, were found down or was seen in the ER, um, binging, we'll, we'll get a referral on them and we go out and we do a follow-up and then we, you know, because of the episode, they are automatically, you know, eligible for the study. And, and right now I just came back from Baltimore doing a training. We're providing self-administered oral quick testing, which tests, um, for HIV, but you know, they also would have to go to the hospital and get that confirmatory testing done as well, which is the blood testing. So, you know, I've, I've been about the statistics and the data and, you know, just curious to what are our numbers? You know, I know that there's only so much that the hospital here can do for these patients that do test positive. You know, a lot of it's referred out to like Phoenix somewhere in the bigger cities. Um, so I just find this lecture really, really interesting today. Well, I'm glad and, and, and your insights are so important to, to the work that um, any Native American, ha Native American community has, right? Is that we need to get a good handle on what the situation is, whether we're taking HIV, whether we're taking uh, any other type of these disenfranchised groups into account. And I think that work you're doing is very important. And, and I commend you on that. And, and please add to this lecture as we go along, because um, it, it, it's just such an important topic. Because when we talk about HIV, this is a disorder that people can disassociate with but also understand. But the people who are suffering from it are the ones who are really the people that we should be focusing on, right? Is that we can come to this understanding of what HIV is, but we don't have that lived experience, right? And so, Thank you for that insight, and that it's a beautiful insight. I just really appreciate that those comments. Okay. Any other questions before we move on to these other notes about uh, HIV and and the trans transgendered population? Thank you for that insight. That 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 was incredible. Thank you. I don't particularly have like a note, but I do have um, like just some questions. Uh, if anybody under like has already like a supportive role um, that's supporting like youth that are um, like tran transitioning and like um, and just awareness of HIV. Um, for my community uh, in Kansas, we don't have any um, like supports. And um, there was an incident recently where our leadership, our tribal council um, is trying to force one of our trans youth um, out of their position uh, in our youth leadership um, because they feel that um, they shouldn't be transitioning. They should, they should be the gender um, that was associated with them at birth. And so, um, so we got a lot of pushback. And so from my tribe, um, I'm the director of education and it was 
um, the pushback they feel is because they're in my youth leadership program. And um, I just don't know how to be more supportive um, to my youth and how I can really um, get the community more involved and support uh, our very, very special and delicate youth that is a, do, um, a part of their trans transition journey. Oh. It's such an interesting statement that you just made because I think that that is something that uh, most communities beyond Native American communities is conflicted with, right? Because we were all, mm, okay. When, when, when we were westernized, when the, this culture in the United States was westernized, we were taught that there's this binary, men, women, men love women, women love men. And that binary has been written into law. And it's only been the last, what is it, 10 years where, where it's been permitted that same-sex relationships can get married in this country, right? And so when we look at specifically trans in the Native American community, one of the things that we need to recognize is that westernization of, uh, 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 of this attitude, of this idea that there's just this binary, okay? And I think I brought it up in this class before, I, I think I have at least, where we have said that the ideas about marriage and about relationships and everything have become so westernized that we have intimate partner violence in Native American communities now. We have HIV in Native American communities now. We have all of these things that if westernization didn't occur, they wouldn't exist. There is no case, uh, I'm, I'm gonna pre bring up intimate violence partner. There is no recorded case of intimate partner violence among Native Americans before colonization. And once colonization happened, we see uh, intimate partner violence, HIV, within family violence, all of those things start to evolve. And it's such an interesting topic because in your situation, you have a Native American council, if I, if I heard you correct, that is going with what Western society state should be the way that we should be. But before Westernization, homosexuality, lesbianism, family, all of those things, none of those resulted into violence. The violence that occurred among Native Americans was between tribes, not within tribes. And I think it's such an interesting topic for us to explore, especially when we're working with primarily a Native American population, is that this idea that language dictates who you should be, such as male, female, trans, all of those things, it's, it's kind of a foreign thing if we date ourselves three, 400 years ago. And so what I would say in, in response to your comment is that, are we really being responsive to our community? And if the answer is no, then we need to do something about it. And in your situation, uh, I'll just bring this up. If you need a letter of support, email me. Uh, I'd be more than happy to write an email or, or a letter to say, hey, this, this isn't how traditionally communities before westernization have cared for community members. And, and 
and I apologize to the, the to to the class. This is this is a topic that is very sensitive to me, um, and that I'm very I, I'm very responsive to even when I'm not working. Whenever I'm working with any community, we shouldn't disenfranchise anybody because they have a different idea of what love and sexuality is. I don't know if I responded to your comment correctly. Uh, so, so uh, um, that is there anything else I can add to to what you're saying? Um, I guess my question is, how could I be a more of a support? And it's just because our leadership um, is the one who's trying to push our youth out and that that particular youth out of their position of leadership in the community. And they have this the other youth support this young person in their transition and in their work in community. So um, I just don't know how to go along with more support um, for the youth that is transitioning. So, so what I would say is one, you can utilize, I feel like this class, right? You can ask any of us, I feel, for letters of support and, and whatnot, but it's really about building a coalition that supports that youth based on traditional ideals instead of westernized ideals and 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 i think that 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 is the best route to take is to say hey we're not living up to our traditional values if i'm assuming those values are what i've read about i'm not going to assume that i know them okay or no one should assume that we know them but I think it's going back to those traditional values and saying, hey, in our past, these individuals were valued for these reasons. And this is why they're important. The other thing is, is I think, you know, building a coalition around this person and saying, hey, there's people within our community that support you and there's people outside our community that support you. And, and I think that building that coalition with everyone uh, is, I think would be the best route because that is how things have, have been handled in a lot of Native American communities is that there has to be this, this complete, idea that we're all on the same page. And if you have a leadership that is going against that, then based on what we know, that really is going against Native American values and what really made uh, peoples of this country strong. Um, I don't know if that advice is valuable. Does anybody else, can, can anyone else speak up? Um. I, I would probably um, look into tribal policies of some kind. I mean, you know, because that just, just hearing that that's discriminating and we're not supposed to discriminate, you know, race, gender and all of that, especially coming from the tribal council or the tribal leaders themselves. And, you know, that just because they are in power doesn't mean that they should be little or um, hurt somebody in that way because you know I mean that it's already one thing for somebody to come out like that and you never know their mental state you know I mean it could lead somebody to having ideations and then acting upon it too so um, I would look in policies or something and see you know where because that does it sounds like discrimination Yes, <laughs> it does. And I, I've actually brought that up. And it's just, I just didn't know what to do. And if anybody had any other thoughts, um, I, I'm really open to explore them and really happy. Um, recently, my family and I um, have um, started to create, um, I wouldn't say a coalition, but a space for because we also have a, uh, my youngest, or my oldest is a 
um, is a transitioning um, boy. And so, um, and after I seen that in a youth that is not much older than my child, um, I really wanna support to make sure community is safe and children are safe to be whom they would like to be. And I, I just didn't know if anybody else had any um, more information um, just to understand kind of how the supports I mean, like tribal nations, because this, this is, I feel like this is a really big thing that's happening and for the youth to come out and support each other, I think that's even bigger. And I just don't know how to lead that, I guess. I don't, uh, for myself, I don't know how to lead that. And, and, and I think what you're mentioning is a lot of the ambig ambiguity about how to support individuals in this larger cultural impingement. I, I am going to yield, Leanne, you mentioned in your, can, can, can you talk about um, what you mentioned in the chat? You just put just a comment, but what about when tribal members is banished from the reservation? I could be off on the topic. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Because I think, I think what, what everyone is experiencing here is kind of on that same level. So Leanne, can you kind of talk more about or elaborate about your comment? And Lauren, um, and Lauren, I think you have an important perspective too. So if Leanne and Lauren can just kind of briefly talk about what they mentioned in the chat room, I really think it would be um, good for the class to hear. So Lauren and Leanne, um, I'll yield the floor to you. Uh, okay, Lauren, I, it's no worries, no worries. Leanne, can you, um, uh, do, do, do you have mic ability and can talk about some of the things you were talking about? And, and I'll just read kind of what Leanne has stated here. It is a process, but if a tribal member is known to make trouble, they tend to be banished. Um, and I've heard that a lot uh, um, among, among communities that, 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 that because they are trying to make themselves recognizable and make themselves known to their community, that the community completely banishes them. So I get Leanne's statement regarding that. Um, and so let, let, let's talk about this because we have a couple weeks in this class, all right? So what are some suggestions from classmates about helping building a coalition for transgendered individuals within the Native American setting? I'm going to stop. I'm actually going to... Uh, I'm going to stop sharing because I want to make some notes because I think this is an important topic. Is I'm going to I'm going to bring up a word document. And I'm going to leave it up to the group to say these are some suggestions that we should do in order to um, assist in this situation. So we're talking again about a disenfranchised group where, correct me if I'm wrong, that the individual is being said they can't take part in in a leadership position, in any part of the cultural society. So as a, 
if if you were a group facilitator and you were hearing this what questions would you ask your group or would you challenge to to assist in this situation and i'm going to leave it open so y'all better talk because you know we have eight minutes so i don't want to sit here quiet for eight minutes what suggestions W would all of you make as as professional group facilitators working with a disenfranchised group? Well, from my perspective, um, I guess identifying um, how many people in our community, in my community, um, would be affected by um, being told they can't participate or we can't organize an organization that supports um, transgender or LGBTQT or um, people that have and are dealing with HIV because in my, in my community, I know at least of one person who has HIV and, the, and because of the, um, the way people in our community react to um, such news, you know, it's something that um, people look down on. So the person just basically has lived with HIV for almost 30 plus years now. So identifying those people affected would be one of the key components to organizing the support group and then, um, and then bringing the resources in from the outside that already deal, that already know how to deal with um, such support group and have those resources um, help us plan and contribute ideas um, to take to our leaders to identify that this, there's a need in our communities based off of the information that or survey surveys that we get that I would get. Um, that's what my approach would be. I would go out into my community um, and then on top of that, um, we do have people who just don't talk about things like this. And, you know, it's something that we're not supposed to talk about. Some, some people take that as, you know, you're not supposed to talk about this because they're traditional or whatever, or it goes against our, our beliefs. But um, like I said, we have to have, we have to make sure people understand that um, there's the new norm that we do have people in these kinds of situations and that we need to be very sensitive to their topics and to their decisions that they make in life and we have to be there regardless what personal opinions we have. Um, that would be my approach um, in supporting and creating a group in my community to um, help um, interact and understand um, and help those people um, overcome the challenges that, that we already are faced with. Beautiful statement. I think that's awesome. And, and Lauren put this in the, and I hope I identify, identify resources to assist with leadership decision-making, identify the community rates by not participating in community. And then I, I just read a chat from Lauren who, who said we need to address the issue of oppression, right? And is that really who, who we are as a people, because that's something that um, has been, again, I'm gonna say this, there's always been in the Americas conflict over land, all right? And so that's conflict between tribes. But one thing that hasn't been addressed is this idea that when westernization occurred that it became within the tribe that there's people within the tribe that don't fit here they don't belong here they don't they, they're disenfranchised as as you just mentioned right very eloquently and thank you for that statement um but I do think that, you know, when we're addressing issues within a community, we need to understand where those issues of oppression came from, if that makes sense. And that, yes, I, I, I agree. Maybe it means taking some people who know 
that oppression issue like HIV or AIDS and stuff from the outside and saying, hey, give us your input. But then making it clear that the decisions that need to be made shouldn't be a westernized decision making process, right? It should be a, everyone should agree to it. It shouldn't just be a few leaders within a tribe. And even when we're talking about our broader culture, it shouldn't be a decision made by an individual, right? Or, 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 or a couple of individuals. That what made society successful before westernization was that people were about the community and they protected the community. instead of outside interests. So I, I, I just wanted to elaborate on those things and, and, and thank you for your input. Everyone else, come on, I'm, I'm chattering now. We, we, only have, I, we only have about a minute left. I wanna hear at least from two other people. Come on, I know I you all have something, something to say. Oh, I think something that uh, that could be addressed is a normalizing it, um, like decolonizing, of course, our our thought processes in regards to like how our culture is, like it pertains to culture and just like normalizing um, people being who they are and being okay and feeling safe, creating safe spaces and community. I think that's a huge thing because like as a youth and for a youth to be told by like tribal leadership, something like this, it like, it creates like such a, like a block between the community and that person is that they feel like, okay, cause these are our spokesmen of our community. And for them to say, no, you can't be who you are. You have to fit into a box that we feel comfortable in fitting in. How do we, I just, I guess, clean that safe space and normalizing? What a beautiful statement. And, and uh, um, uh, I'm at a loss of words. So I'm just gonna say that, that that's such an important statement to say that the normalization how do you say normal is not normal until it becomes abnormal and then it becomes normal again? And if you follow that logic, um, it's strange how, 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 how normalized we expect people to be without, without accepting, without exception, right? Um, Lauren put in the chat that it's an important statement. Winona recognizes that it's society's issue that is now a part of the native company. What, what an amazing statement that is, uh, native communities, I must say. And Rhonda went on to say, if we can hit on the young people, it would be comfortable to speak out. And, and I think that's another important point is what point of intervention or prevention are we looking for? Should we be looking at the youth or should we be looking at the elderly um, um, leadership, okay? And I know within our communities that elders are an important part of that, that they become the, really the educators of the youth. And, and, and that's an important part of youth, right? But at what point, do we need to say that those views may be detrimental to our culture, to our, to, to our community? Um, Rhonda went on to say on the challenges that they face and to not be fixated on just one topic. And Rhonda, I think that's an important point and we'll end with this today uh, because I, I, I really love this conversation, but I know we're we're, we're, we're out of time. 
is that um, one of the issues that, that, that we have when we're dealing in a group setting, whether we're dealing with an addict, while we're dealing with a, a transgender, not dealing with, that's bad terminology. When working with someone with addiction problems, when we're working with somebody who has have, been have, having difficulties with their identity, their sexual identity, when we're working with these populations, such as individuals with HIV and, and whatnot, is that our job really is to be there for them. Um, and, and we have to challenge, a, challenge the biases that our communities have against them because as things evolve, especially with the youth, they are what's going to be the future of our communities. And if we don't focus on the youth and we only focus on the leadership and what the leadership wants, that leadership is gonna be gone. I know that sounds weird and sounds strange, but it's the truth. We have to start with the youth and then we need to build up to the importance of the education that we're given from our elders and from our leadership, if that makes any sense. Uh, uh, Laura, Laura mentioned, and we'll end, uh, we're, we're a little bit over time. It will also have to be individual terms. Yes, to not always be accepted in society, they'll have mentally prepared themselves and to be content with world opinion. And Laura, what an important statement that is, right? Because not only do we need to, I'm not gonna say fight, we need to advocate for the rights of disenfranchised groups, but we also in the group setting have to provide that reality, right? As Laura is stating that reality and how to work through that and those coping skills necessary to work through that being part of a disenfranchised group. Uh, and Laura also put, I will also have to be the individual term to not always being accepted in society. Oh, oh, oh I think I already read them. Leanne put, I, I'll, I'll put this. Leanne, I agree with Winona, Lauren, R Rhonda, and Laura. I was surprised when my daughter was open about this. She was also surprised at my reaction that I was accepting. And that I think is an important statement is that just because there's these societal dictums that say man, woman are the only acceptable relationship that you either you're a man or you're a woman and that's the acceptable gender, that binary idea we need to build this community of support, as Leanne has mentioned, that accepts those individuals and says, no, you know what? They were open and honest with me. And therefore, we should obligate, obligate the acceptance in the community. And that may be a struggle for a lot of people, especially those who are very, very indoctrinated into that Western dichotomy. And it may be a struggle for a lot of community members, but we have to, we have to give that support somewhere. And that's where the group setting really begins, if that makes sense. Okay. So everyone, I'm sorry, we have gone, I'm, I'm keeping you, long after the time period. So what I'm gonna ask you is, is if there's any more comments or questions, please write them down. And when we have class on Monday, we will address all of the questions and comments that you guys are making because they're beautiful comments, but I don't want to keep anyone from living what they're going through and, and living their life and keeping them over the extended period of our class period. So, I'm going to say, please, if you have more questions, comments, please write them down and we'll go over them on Monday. Um, 
but 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 I do want to let you all. I want to respect everyone's time and um, uh, close down class right at the moment, unless there's any other comments that that, that I feel really need to be made right at this moment. All right, everyone's saying none. Uh, please write down your questions and let's continue this conversation on Monday. Uh, take care, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your week. Remember to do your weekly reflections. Yes, I do read them. Um, and, and take care. Okay, everyone? Have a good night. Good night. Thank you.